Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Thank you so much to Audible for sponsoring today's episode. For those of you who don't know, Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, business motivation, and also podcasts. They've recently launched their newest plan called Audible Plus. With Audible Plus, you get full access to their Plus catalog filled with thousands of select originals, audiobooks, and podcasts, and connects you to just amazing content. The best time to try it is now with their holiday offer, because for only four ninety a month for your first six months. This is a fantastic deal. And all you have to do to get it is visit audible.com slash Zibby, Z-I-B-B-Y, or text Zibby, Z-I-B-B-Y, to 500-500. Again, visit audible.com slash Zibby or text Zibby to 500-500. 500. I love Audible and listen all the time in my car and on walks. I recently finished searching for Sylvie Lee by Jean Kwok, also Small Animals by Kim Brooks, His Only Wife by Peace Medi, and also On All Fronts by Clarissa Ward. So those are four of my recent ones. Um, I hope you'll join me in checking out Audible, audible.com slash Zibby, or text Zibby to 500-500. Did I say that enough times? Kim Brooks is the author of Small Animals, Parenthood in the Age of Fear, an NPR Best Book of the Year described by the National Book Review as an impassioned, smart work of social criticism and a call for support and empathy. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, New York Magazine, Good Housekeeping, Chicago Magazine, Salon, BuzzFeed, and other publications. She has spoken as a guest on CBS This Morning, PBS NewsHour 2020, NPR's All Things Considered, Good Morning America, The Brian Lehrer Show, and many other radio shows and podcasts. Her novel, The House Guest, was published in 2016. She currently lives in Chicago. Hi. Hello. I'm sorry I'm a minute late. No problem. I listened to your book. I like listened to most of it in the car, like on a few drives. So I feel like you're like my friend. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like <laughs> I'm so used to your voice. It's been like all I've been listening to. So anyway. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was, it was fun to record. I'd never done anything like that before. And I was like, by the time we got to the end, I was like, wow, acting is really work. Actors work. <laughs> <You know>? like, <laughs> I mean, not that I, you know, I guess I did kind of think they didn't work, but no, it's hard to, to read something that long. But. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> but fun to listen to. Okay. Small Animals, Parenthood in the Age of Fear. This was so great. I literally, like the first chapter, I was like, wow, like this person gets it like nobody else. And I'm sure people tell you this all the time, but I have four kids myself and I hadn't even read your book. I don't know how I had missed it, but I read your fantastic New York Times article about divorce in the Corona era. And I was like, I have to talk to you. And then I read your book and I was like, ah. <laughs> So anyway, here we are. Would you mind telling people who have not read Small Animals what this book is about and what inspired you to write it, particularly, you know, the incident? Sure. Well, the incident that kind of sparked the book took place, it's quite a while ago now. So it was, let's see, I think about nine years ago now. And I was home visiting my parents in Virginia. I, I live in Chicago and I was with my kids and my son who was about four and a half at the time. The day that we were leaving, I ran to a store about a mile from my parents' house. And this is very like suburban, you know, rural suburban area where I grew up. And when we got to the store, he asked if he could wait in the car. I was just going in to get one thing. And so I let him wait in the car for about five minutes Which was something that I honestly always remembered doing as a kid. I mean, in the same area, like I remembered waiting in the car while my parents did, you know, ran into the store or, you know, went to look at furniture at Sears or whatever. (laughs) Like I just always remember like sitting in the car and it was like 
a pleasurable memory. And I thought, you know, this is just, just like a quick five minute thing. So I pulled up in front. I got, when I got back to the car, everything was fine. He was playing with my mom's iPad and we headed back to Chicago. And I would, it was only later that I found out that someone who I would never meet and never see had seen me run into the store and, and let him wait there and had called the police. And the police had then showed up at my parents' house and they were sort of looking for me and wanted to press charges because they viewed, you know, what, that I had done something dangerous. So it was just this one incident that kind of snowballed into like a year and a half of various types of difficulty, legal and and otherwise in my life. But that's not really what the book is about. So the book, that's kind of the narrative like backbone of the book. But what the book is really about, I think, is, you know, me kind of examining like our notions of what it means to be a good parent and what it means to protect our children and kind of thinking about why those ideas have changed so radically in the course of a generation or two, you know, kind of for the first, and and this, it was really the first point in my life when this happened that I started to think, you know, until then I was very much kind of going with the the pack, running with the herd of, of anxious parents. And that was the first moment when I was like, you know, this, this is kind of strange how obsessed everybody is with protecting and safety and kind of fear of public spaces in a way that is so different from just, you know, 30 years ago. And so like, why have things changed? Is the world more dangerous for kids? And if, and if not, which is what I found out, then what's happening? What's happening to kind of the culture of parenthood? I agree. I think that's what your book's about too. And it was so interesting to get that lens. I mean, I feel like I don't know exactly how old you are, but I also grew up, I'm 44 now. And so I grew up in a time where I like sat in the back of the station wagon all the time while my mom went in. And okay, one time I like crawled in the front and smashed it into a dumpster. But for the most part, like I was left and I was fine. And that's just what happened. And, you know, I watch even home videos and my brother and I are like playing, like about to fall in the pool all the time. (laughs) Like she's like sunbathing. Like it's just, that is the way it was. And, Like in your scene, you had, you know, when you visited your family and your mom was playing mahjong or something in the other room with her friends and talking about like how crazy we all are as a generation of parents and how they hadn't done it. Like I just so related to that because there is this like even within families sort of culture shock in parenthood that like has everybody scratching their heads and you tried to explain it. I shouldn't say tried to. You tried to unearth what the root cause of all of that was. And I just so appreciated you trying to like, you know, unlock the key to all of that because it affects me so on like a daily basis. And I'm sure so many other people. Yeah. I mean, and I should say it's, it's funny. I'm about the same age. I'm 42. And it's interesting that you bring up your childhood and I think about it a lot. And, and I should say that, you know, there's many kind of strands to the mystery that I try to tease out in the book. But I do think that one of those strands is sort of a reaction in people our generation against maybe some of the permissiveness of, you know, the 80s culture and sort of like, not all of us, but I think a lot of us feel like our parents were very distracted or very focused on kind of themselves. You know, it was a time where there was just a lot of, a lot of divorce, a lot of, you know, women on the one hand were going back into the workforce, which was wonderful, but our country didn't really step up to you know, provide any kind of system for like support, you know, national daycare or leave or anything like that. So there was this kind of like frantic sense of like, you know, nobody's watching the kids. Like that was kind of a cultural anxiety. And I think that from the kids' perspective, I think there was sometimes a feeling of like, that there was a lack of sort of presence, of adult presence in our lives. Some of that, I think, people have very nostalgic, positive memories of that kind of independence in childhood. But I also think some of us have have negative memories too, but I think what's happened is with our generation, there's been kind of an overcorrection. And so there's this sense of like, it's funny, this is a slight digression, but I was watching Big with my daughter a few nights ago and we've kind of got it. She's 10 now and we've got it on this 
80s movie kick. And one thing I noticed that I thought was so funny was, I don't, have you seen Big? I saw it with my kids recently. So keep going. Yes. <laughs> so, so obviously there's, you know, there's tons of things where you're like, oh my God, that's so different. You know, the, the lead woman character is smoking. I mean, a really yep. funny thing. Yep. My daughter's like, why is she smoking? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, people, people did it. <laughs> so, but the funny thing that I caught was that scene where Tom Hanks, and the girlfriend are at the dinner party and the guy's kid comes in, the guy who's hosting the dinner party and says, you know, dad, I need help with my homework. And the guy's kind of like, not now, son, you know, I'm doing something. Adult. And I just thought like, that would never even be in a movie. Like it would be so unimaginable to show that scene where like a parent says, I'm doing an adult thing go deal with this yourself, you know? And I thought if they shot that movie now, it would be like, you know, everything would stop. All, you know, the parent would kind of have this very public display of I'm going to help my son, you know? And it just, it just was one of those small details about how much like the culture, you know, the culture has, has changed. I was thinking when I watched that movie, like I couldn't believe the kids are just wandering around the neighborhood by themselves all the time and biking and wandering and like, like who, what? They just like go in and out of the house whenever they want. And that was the part that I was like, wow. And they were so little too in the movie. Well, especially like the friend, like the whole premise is his friend keeps coming into New York City. Yes, that too. Like, I mean. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I just got to be home by 10. So my yeah, parents don't. Exactly. But I mean, there was, it's like, that was, you know, there were no cell phones. There were, there were no GPS tracking devices. And so, you know, the two alternatives were either you kept your kid literally locked inside the house till they were 18, or you gave them some independence and you tried to teach them, you know, skills and you gave them some freedom. But I think now, I mean, maybe somewhat it it is caused by technology. There's this sense that like, we can be watching our kids all the time and we can be connected to our kids all the time. But then there's the question of should we yep. and what kind of happens if we, if we accept that. I have this confession, which I haven't even thought about in a while, but I was so like on top of my twins from the moment they were born. Now my last two kids, I'm like much, much better. I'm not so crazy, but my twins, I was like, I stayed home with them. And so it was my job and I was going to not let them out of my sight. And I was like, And then when they went to school for their first field trip, I was like, well, what do you mean? You're just going to take them on a two and a half hour drive. What if something happens? What if there's an accident? What if, what if, what if? And so I got them these little like GPS things and I like hid them in their backpacks. And then all day I was like, are they okay? It's kind of raining. I don't know. What if the road's slippery? I mean, this is obviously my own issue. And I'm like, you know, as I said, I'm better now. But as a first time parent, I was like... And that's crazy. I mean, I would like go away with friends for entire weekends and, you know, whatever. They'd be like, fine, goodbye. Have fun in Woodstock, you know? (laughs) Right. It's just, yeah, exactly. The technology has changed our notions of what is possible in a way that, yeah. But I also loved, and not to jump around too much, but like I loved your chapter on moms competing against each other and why everyone is so quick to like put down each other's choices and why when we should all be, you know, lifting each other up and, you know, being one big community, moms are so quick to put down other people's choices, which basically stems, of course, from not feeling confident essentially in your own choice. And that so much of the time, it's not even really a choice. It's where you just had to end up. And instead of being upset or something, you have to just own it. And so you like double down on it and they're like, well, I picked this. So shame on you for not picking the same thing. Anyway, yeah. that was a summary, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I should say like, I, you know, I feel like when I wrote the book, which is a number of years ago now, like I was in maybe a moment of feeling, you know, a little bit disenchanted by that kind of competitive mom culture. But, you know, as the years have passed and I've, I've like reflected on it more, I really want to say that like, I actually, I don't blame moms at all for feeling competitive or insecure or, you know, like comparing themselves to others, to other mothers. I think that we kind of live in this culture that undermines women and undermines mothers in so many different ways, both subtle and overt. We kind of get the message that women don't know what's best for their own children. You have to defer to some authority figure. And it, you know, it's, it's things as 
outrageous as like women being arrested for making reasonable parenting choices to like small things, you know, kind of small condescensions that take place or just the, this, the culture that tells us like the answer is in a book we need to buy or a product we need to buy or a blog we need to subscribe to or whatever, when really like most women know what's best for their children. And, you know, and I think that that's one of the hopefully... One of the good things that will come, I hope, from the pandemic, kind of in the aftermath, is that I do think there's been more and more women who are saying, who are kind of taking ownership of their choices and taking control of it and saying, you know, like maybe how my kid does on the standardized test in the context of like a worldwide plague isn't the most important thing. You know, maybe we have can have different values. Maybe you know, sitting in front of the computer all day isn't the best way. And, you know, I'm going to homeschool or I'm going to work with my neighbors or, you know, do things that sort of a year or two ago would have seemed really radical and like unconventional choices. And now we've kind of been given an opportunity to do that. Very true. You also point out how there is no such thing as basically harassment of a mom, right? That there's like sexual harassment suits and all these other ways, which other groups are protected, but not really for moms. Like anyone can poke their nose in your business. A policeman can have feel like he has a right to interrupt somebody at Starbucks like you wrote about or any of that. And the moms kind of just have to take it. Whereas if it was a dad, it'd be like, oh, he must have had something really important to do. It's no biggie. I don't know. I found that very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, I think it's it's true. I think it's still very true. I think that there's kind of a sense that if we can pose something as being an issue of child safety, mm-hmm. then mothers have no rights, right? Then Then that priority takes away any kind of rights of a mother and any kind of rights of a child, you know, that, that the children don't have rights to do things either if there's any risk to their safety, you know, but the problem is being alive is risky and being a person in the world is risky. I, you know, I, I know in the book there was, there's a point where I interview this social scientist at UC Irvine and she kind of makes that point where she says, you know, if some politician, I won't name any in particular, but if some politician got on TV and said, you know, I love women so much and we just need to protect them from something terrible happening to them and women are abducted by strangers or assaulted, so women need to not be out in public by themselves just because I want to protect them. We would say, you know, thanks, but no thanks, right? I'll take what, we'll take that risk because we want to be people who move through the world. And what this woman said, this social scientist was that, you know, well, people will say that that doesn't, that same principle doesn't apply to children. And she says, I don't think that's exactly right. Obviously it's not the same, but children do have some rights and children have some rights to, to some amount of, of risk. So interesting. Wow. And now the most recent article you wrote for the Times, which was so good, and I am divorced and it's been five years and remarried, but, you know, COVID has elevated some issues sort of under the surface as it most stressful things are want to do. And so I, I, you know, I found myself particularly relating to your essay, but the fact you almost point out that like, well, why don't you why, why don't you say more about it? Because there are so many different pieces of it that I, I found so interesting. Not the least of which is that you had to like do all the court stuff and finalize everything with your lawyers on Zoom, which is crazy. And I also felt like having just finished this book, I was like, oh no, they broke up, you know. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, so we did break up, <laughs> but he is, as I say in the essay, he lives across the street. Yeah. And which, which, and I live here. I live here with my partner, who's hiding upstairs, and he lives with his partner. And I, and I should say we were. We were separated for a long time before we divorced. So some some people had written to me and they were like, how did you find another partner in the middle of a pandemic? (laughs) (laughs) We, We were separated for some time. But, you know, I just, I think that there's this idea that divorce sort of has to be a tragedy 
for children and for family. And that if you get divorced some, from someone, it means that you hate them and you blame them. And there's all this conflict and animosity. And I'm not going to say that there haven't been any moments of conflict, obviously, you know, there's conflict with when you're, when you're dealing with like a big change, but, but overall, I think that we both kind of chose to take the view that, this was something that was good for both of us, you know, that, and that, and that the fact that it was, we were moving from being husband and wife to being co-parents and friends and next door neighbors for the time being, that that didn't have to be a tragic thing, that it, it might be hard, it might be a transition, but that, you know, we were married for 16 years and we didn't kill each other and we brought two amazing kids into the world and that, you know, we could like cherish that and still say this is the best thing for both of us and see it as a kind of growth, you know, and, and a restructuring of our family as opposed to, you know, the a destruction of our family, which is, I think, kind of the traditional way we think about divorce. Yeah, I love that the divorce lawyer said she was in family restructuring. That's so genius. I loved it. <laughs> oh my gosh. So but I want to ask you though, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, sure. So you've been divorced for five years and so were your kids pretty young when that was? Yes. Yeah, so they were very, very young. I have four kids and we separated when my my youngest was about nine months old. Oh, wow. But it had, I mean, I'm not supposed to talk about it publicly, but yeah, it, had, just, been, it had been brewing. It had been, this was no, this, you know. <laughs> I won't, I just was curious more about like, did you find in the years that followed that there was still a lot of stigma to, to sort of being a divorced person with small children? Because that's that's kind of the thing that I found interesting is that I sort of thought like, you know, well, I mean, I guess I thought both things because I've, I've internalized the stigma, but then I was also conscious of it. And it is it is funny that, you know, it's it's 2020, but it was still that it's still sort of stigmatized to have kids and, to, you know, to, to say, no, I'm getting a divorce, you know, and this is what's for the best. And that there were still so many people who sort of but, you know, viewed it as like this horrible, that, that it has to be like a horrible thing. Did, did you have a similar yes, experience? I did. And I was shocked actually by the responses when I started telling people about it, which I've, by the time I finished sort of telling and everything water under, I've realized it has all to do with their own marriages, right? People's responses. It's all about how they feel. It has nothing to do with me and my kids and my kids' lives or anything. But I didn't know that at the time. So I feel like I've tried to tell people who I know who are like newly getting divorced, like, okay, take all the responses with a grain of salt, right? But yeah, I had people like bursting into tears and be like, but your kids. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But I actually believe strongly this decision is the best thing for my kids. And I still believe that. And it sucks and it's hard. And it's not to say I don't cry still a lot when they leave or if they get sad. You know, now my youngest is almost six. So this has been their whole lives, my two youngest and my oldest are twins, they're 13. So they're used to it now. But yeah, a lot of people were like, are you sure that, you know, are you sure? Like the poor kids, you know? And I'm like, well, you don't know, you don't know what it was or what it will be. You just don't know. Right. Right. But I think you're right that it has more to do with, with people's own insecurities. Right. And it's like, there's a lot of people who like, don't want it divorce to be a reasonable choice. Right. Because if divorce is, it's not about, it's not about obviously people like you and I, you and I aren't going around saying everybody should get divorced. No, no. I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> I wish I weren't. I mean, you know. I'm of course, you know, but it's like, but when we, but when people say, you know, but for me, for us, for our family, this was the best choice, you know, to some people who have put up with a lot or who have accepted less than sat, you know, really unsatisfying relationships. It's like, oh, that that's a choice. That's a reasonable choice you can make. It's very can be very destabilizing. I think. yes. And for so many people feel so trapped, and that they want to leave but they can't, or they can't afford to leave, or they can't. I mean, there's so many reasons why people stay. Even yesterday, I just saw this ad for Purina Dog Chow that said there's like this new initiative because. 
47% of domestic abuse victims don't leave because they don't want to leave their pets, which oh I thought was God. so interesting. Do you know, like, I'm like, okay, so now there's like another wrinkle. Like, so I don't know. It's, it, it's very hard. And, you know, if you can and you need to, and you're able to, that's one thing, but so many people aren't able to. And yes. And you're just a mirror. You're just a mirror for their feelings or their, their feelings of failure or their sadness at what they don't have and whatever. But, and it, but it, it sort of circles back to the book the issues about in the book about when, you, you know, it's true that it's very hard for a lot of people to leave, but some of that I think has to do with our lack of kind of autonomy as parents and our lack of like a support system, our lack of like a wider community or sort of social, social safety nets, right? That people feel, feel trapped sometimes in, in unhealthy marriages because women literally are trapped because mm-hmm. they're like financially dependent, dependent in other ways. And that that's, you know, that that's something that hopefully will start to change. I mean, I feel like the only times that I really feel like I'm in a community and not to say I don't have a lot of friends and people I love and people who are great with my kids, but it's only when something absolutely terrible happens where I cannot move when I actually feel that. Like, hey, can you pick up the kids today? Could you, would you mind taking so-and-so home with you or something? And, and then people are, of course, and like, I would love to help other people. It's just not like, it's not as, it's just not, at least in my, I mean, I hope that this is different in some other communities where people do take, but I feel like in your experience and mine, that's not what it has been like, which is a shame. No, it is a shame. And I think it's very much due to this culture of the nuclear family and this sort of idea that it's, it's every mom for herself. It's every nuclear family for themselves. And that, you know, to ask for help or, or to reach out is to sort of like impose impose on people, you know, instead of like, no, this is what humans do is they help each other out. I mean, one of the saddest parts of writing small animals was when I talked to this woman, Deborah Harrell, who's an African American woman who she was charged with endangerment or neglect for letting her, her daughter play unsupervised in a park while she went to work one day at McDonald's because she didn't have childcare, her childcare fell through. The daughter was completely fine. And, you know, there was a a very busy park with tons of adults. There was like a camp running there. There were like a lot of kids. And when I was doing that part of the book, I watched online, there was a, they, they since took it down, but there was a video of her being interrogated by this police officer and after she was arrested and he just kept kind of belittling her and saying, this is your daughter, you know, she's your responsibility. Nobody else is, nobody else is responsible for this girl. And I, and she was crying as he said this. And I just thought it just was so heartbreaking because on the one hand, it's like, this woman knows that no one else is looking out for her kid. I mean, this is a single mom who's taking care of her kid on her own, you know? And second of all, I thought it's true. And isn't that a tragedy? I mean, isn't that so heartbreaking that we live in a country where nobody cares about other people's kids and that the expectation is that you look out for your kid and no one else is and no one's going to do it for you. And it's really sad. And again, you know, I hope that that's something that will will change as we kind of reexamine everything. So what is your like, what's coming next for you and what are you up to and all that now? (laughs) Well, so I am actually working on a new book about marriage and divorce and female friendship and a bunch of other things. I think it's going to be called Nobody's Okay on Marriage, Madness, and Rebellion. And it's sort of, it's sort of, it's a memoir and kind of general nonfiction. And it sort of is kind of takes up where small animals leave, leaves off. So it's like the last six years of my life kind of in, in navigating all of these things. And I'm very excited about it. We, my agent was going to send it out to publishers about a week ago, but we decided that everyone was too distracted by the election. Like literally, like I went to Starbucks and the woman giving me my coffee wanted to talk about the debate. 
with me. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone's very distressed, you know, everyone's very anxious and focused right now. So anyway, we said that we're going to send it out after the election, but that's hopefully will be my next project. And do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Gosh, I guess my advice is to just be kind of compassionate with yourself, you know, and to sort of see see writing or whatever you're trying to do as kind of like to look at the long game. I write a little bit about this in small animals and more so in this new book, but, you know, I think about the many years of feeling like I wasn't a real writer because I hadn't published a book, you know, and feeling like even though I was writing all the time, like it didn't count somehow. And, you know, of course that just made everything worse. So I guess just, I, this is not very original, but just, you know, a, a writer is somebody who writes and that, you know, just because you haven't reached the milestone you might want to yet doesn't mean you're not going to get there eventually. Love it. Well, thank you, Kim. Thanks for talking today. Thanks for your book and your article and all the rest. And I can't wait for your next book. It's awesome. Thank you. It was great talking to you. You too. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for Audible sponsoring this episode. Get your amazing deal, $4.95 for six months, for your first six months for their holiday Audible Plus offer. Go to audible.com slash Zibby or text Zibby to 500-500. Thanks, Audible. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 